Would we have a problem in completing the architecture of the euro? So we are raised the, with the issue about the potential survival of euro, but we know that there are many diverse positions, the diverse stands in the euro area. There are many different policies that have been implemented over the past few years that are a, now showing um, many weaknesses. Are economic solutions enough to solve a problem? Don't we probably need more of institutional solutions for the architecture of the single currency to be more complete uh, so as to tackle the future ahead of us? To talk about this complex and central subject, because if the euro survives or doesn't survive, obviously, the quality of life uh, future are going to be badly affected by these different possibilities. So we're not just talking about theory, we're just th we're talking about hard facts, our future. Uh, wealth and well-being, the s sustainability of our welfare systems. And certainly, this also may have repercussions on the other quality of our democracy. To start um, tackling this very difficult, complex subject, we have together with us Luis Garicano, an economist. With an extraordinary career, he comes from Spain. He got his degree in law and uh, uh, economics in Valladolid in Spain. He holds two master, two master degree, one at a college of Europe in Belgium and one in uh, the US with a PhD as well. Professor Gary Cano held a chair uh, for eight years. He spent at the London Business School. He taught at uh, and he now has a chair at the London School of Economics. So he has an extended career. I'm going to hint to a number of research projects of his. Professor Gary, Ga Gary Cano works, worked as an economist at the European Commission and gave important advice to the Spanish government to promote the structural reforms in the field of the real estate building sectors, in the healthcare system, in the labor market, and so on. And And uh, he's also one of the person in charge with the Nada es Gratis, uh, the most famous economic blog in Spain. Nada es Gratis is uh, probably only the access to the blog is gratis, as we say in Italy, i.e. for free. And the uh, name the name of the blog in, says, indeed, nothing is for free. I've been following his work over the past few days. I know exactly about his career as an advisor to the European institutions and as a university professor. He has a very pragmatic, hands-on approach. So he's an economist that really has a hard-on knowledge. He talked about, for example, the effect of credit crunch on um, corporate investments. And he found out that in Italy and in Spain, wherever loans are difficult to obtain, corporations tend to invest short term, uh, doing away with the medium long term investments, following the rule that premium vivere, that what is most important is to survive, but that has also negative repercussions on the survival of organizations. This uh, is a problem affecting both Italian and Spanish companies because they're all so much focused on their short-term survival that they forget about the long-term possibilities for them to survive. I'd like to quote that something that struck me quite a lot about that study on investment as connected to credit crunch. In that document, Professor Garigano considers uh, uh, employee 
labor uh, as a long-term investment because hiring people long-term is an investment for a corporation because that in implies also transfer of value. I found very interesting. I found a, a research project uh, carried out on uh, um, consultants. Very interesting. Information asymmetry causes, has direct repercussions on the distribution of wealth. And indeed, it raises a problem as the market doesn't prevent us from getting in touch with consultants that are self styled wise men. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, being not wise at all. And this proves that Professor Gary Kana really, again, has a hands-on grasp on the things of life. Now, without further ado, I'd like to give him the floor. But before doing so, I'd like to hear a very small video on the festival. Professor Gargano, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm very pleased to be here in this beautiful city. I'm talking English. I'm so sorry. Um, the translator uh, said that I speak very fast. She said, uh, you know, Spanish uh, people who are fluent in English are the worst to translate because the Spanish is spoken very fast. And then if they speak English, then it's just impossible. So I'll do my best. I'll try to speak slowly. Um, it's, very much, uh, it's very much my pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start uh, by talking about <clears throat> what I think is still a financial crisis, an ongoing financial crisis. I think that I'm going to talk about work that I've done with, with several large groups of economists in INET, uh, Euronomics, and uh, some of it forthcoming on the Journal of Economics Perspectives. Um, we all know that we are in a debt crisis. And it does look like, if you think of the four countries that went through rescues, um, the four countries that under, underwent rescues are Ireland, Greece, Spain, and Portugal. In many ways, you would think they are very different, but there is something very common, strikingly common, when you look at that net foreign debt. How much do they owe foreigners? And what you see is that post the Euro crisis, if you, if you think the Euro entry happened in 1999, 2000, uh, if you think about their debt positions on the Euro entry, all of those four countries had uh, a situation that was not necessarily very bad, and in fact, some of them had a pretty good situation. By the time the decade was over, foreign debt had exploded. Um, for all four countries, strikingly at very similar levels, close to 100% of their GDP. If you see Italy, um, it looks much, much better. Um, it didn't have the huge run out of debt that some of these countries had. And this is the main framework that I want to have you think about, to think about whether the euro can survive. Um, what you see here is what we have called the diabolic loop. The diabolic loop is a loop linking the banks and the sovereigns. And it's a loop that 
we is calling diabolic is a feedback loop because it, it pushes both down as the crisis advances. For some countries, the diabolic loop starts on the banks. For some countries, uh, what you have is a lot of private debt. So you're on the right. Banks are bad. And that's particularly Ireland and Spain. The, there is a lot of loans to firms that become bad. There is a lot of problematic assets. And that's going to push up the need for the state to bail them out. And it's going to push Spain and Ireland in trouble. The banks start bad. The countries end up holding a lot of this private debt. For some countries, two of the other four countries that were rescued, what you see is that it starts from the sovereign and heads to the banks. It's first the sovereigns which start by being bad. Um, I would say Greece and Portugal and also Italy. And the banks which hold a lot of debt from those countries end up in trouble as well as a consequence. Now, that loop reinforces itself. Okay? Now, once the sovereigns in Spain and Ireland are also bad, then that deteriorates further the banks in those countries. I would say um, we've been talking about this loop for a long time since the crisis started. and I would say politicians at this point are aware of this. They're aware of, let me just, first, before I tell you what the politicians uh, t are, are doing to solve it, let me tell you why this is deadly and why it wouldn't be deadly without the euro. Without the euro, those debts on the sovereign side are nominal. If the UK has to recapitalize Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds, if the UK has to recapitalize two gigantic banks, two of the biggest banks in the world, that doesn't make people think the UK is a bad country to lend money for. And the reason that doesn't make them scared is because they know that the UK is never going to default. At the end of the day, those pieces of papers, the pounds, are printed by them. They can always print more. Okay? Spain cannot do that. If Spain rescues a bank, it's actually giving it some money that it cannot print. If Italy has to go out and rescue a bank, it has to be worrying that people will stop buying Italian debt. And that will push up interest rates and that will make growth, which is the key thing here, go down. As the banks get worse, people worry that the state is going to be caught and interest rates grow. So the loop could be broken if there was not a monetary union. The problem is we created a monetary union where the banks, just think about this same sovereign loop in the United States. Think that Arizona, or New Mexico have a big housing bubble. What happens? Well, the banks in Arizona and New Mexico don't make Arizona and New Mexico state governments bankrupt because they are rescued by the federal government. The, well, an instrument, a federal instrument, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation takes care of them. All right? Vice versa. The U.S. It's not, the U.S. credit is not getting worse. The banks in, Calif in Arizona don't have in their books Arizona debt. The banks in California don't have in their books California debt. They have U.S. government debt. So they don't suffer from those banks deteriorate, from those states deteriorating. So both of the loop sides are closed. If you don't break that loop, you cannot save the euro. Okay, that is absolutely essential. What is interesting is that, if you remember the summit last year in June, uh, where Monty really made a very, very sharp argument, and he basically threatened to resign uh, if uh, Europe was not uh, acting. Actually, he did manage to get in the communique of the summit this statement. This statement says, 
the governments understand the diabolic loop and they want to break it. They do. Okay? The governments say, we think we have to break this vicious loop and we think that the ESM should be allowed. Europe, okay, like in the United States, the federal government, not the little countries, but the union should be allowed to recap the banks. The problem, of course, is that just after the summit, okay, the summit was extremely good news. The summit means we're going to take care of this. And just after the summit, we start to see people taking steps backwards. We start to see, uh, if immediately after the summit, if a, a top official says in the, in the Wall Street Journal, well, yeah, the ESM will recapitalize the banks, but the risk will be of the sovereign. If Italian banks are in trouble, yeah, Europeans can lend some money, but they will lend it to the Italian government, not to the bank. Okay? Well, the problem is, of course, once you lend it to the government, you're putting the sovereign at risk, and you're continuing this same thing. Okay? Example, after the summit, the ESM did recapitalize the Spanish banks, but all the money was routed through the Spanish government. So it increases the Spanish debt and it makes people worry about Spain. It doesn't stop people worrying about Spain, it makes them worry more. Um, a second big qualifier was this summit. Okay? There was a summit on the 29th of September between Germany, uh, the Netherlands and Finland, big three creditor countries. And what they said was, you know what? We might help banks in the future, but the legacy assets are the problems of the countries. If the banks in the past lend too much money in their own countries, and if they have loans that they can't get back, that's the country's problems. It's not the union's problem. Okay. The problem is the whole issue is the legacy debt. The whole issue is that those banks got lent too much. All this is legacy. Everything that I showed you is legacy. It already happened. And as long as the legacy debt is not resolved, the banks can't stop lending and they cannot start lending and the governments cannot start kind of credibly le lending to the banks, okay? What I'm going to show you, uh, the last qualifier I wanted to show you is from Wolfgang Schaubel, the German uh, finance minister, who said, the German um, treasury, he said, banking union only makes sense when we have European, new European treaties. Um, I hear this a little bit like, okay, we have, you know, a banking union when health freezes over. There is no real demand for big treaty changes now. You're going to have referendums. Citizens will want to use the referendums to complain. It's not really a very positive statement. What I want to do is I want to show you, I want to do a progress report. I want to show you how is this sovereign loop moving along. Okay? I'm going to show it with Spanish data, but it would look very similar in other countries. The reason I show you with Spanish data is I think Spain is the battleground for the euro. The euro will die or live in Spain. Also in Italy. But honestly, I think Spain is first. If you cannot save Spain, Italy kind of will follow. And if you can save Spain, you probably, you probably Italy will also be all right. So let me show you uh, what happened. So the first part of the loop was how much debt from the countries do the banks hold? Are the banks lending a lot to their own countries? Look, this is at the start of the crisis. At the start of the crisis, Spanish banks were lending 80 billion euros to Spanish government. By the time today, they are lending over 250 billion, 25% okay, of Spanish GDP. The sovereign loop on that side, is sovereign banking loop is not getting weaker, it's getting stronger. What do I mean by that? I mean the banks are more exposed to how well the state is doing. If Spain does badly, the Spain suffer more, no less. Okay? What you would want to do is, you would want to break that connection. What you see is the connection gets stronger. Second, 
These are outright loans. The banks, not bonds, but loans from the banks. What you see here is the same thing. The banks are lending more to the local government, lending much more to the regional government, lending more to the central governments of Spain than before. Now, the second part of the loop is the rescues from the banks to the state. Are, is the Spanish state or the Italian state or the Irish state, are the states more exposed to the bank's troubles? And what you will see is, yes, they are. These are the guarantees that the Spanish government has been given on the right. On the left, you have the total amount of transfers that the Spanish state has given to the banks. And what you see in both cases is big increase. What you see is that as the crisis advances, there is more of a tight link on that side as well. And you could say, is this affecting growth? Does this really matter? Do we care? My view is it does. It affects growth in a very fundamental way. That's my third point there, and I'm going to show you. Is there any causal evidence of this effect? Do we really have evidence that growth is suffering? Here, uh, Samuel Bentolila, a, a, a very good uh, labor economist in Spain, and, and three co-authors, some from the Bank of Spain, what they've done is they've shown how banking, being, being a firm whose bank is weak, how it's affecting your firm. Okay? If you, the theory would be, look, if you're a good firm, you should get funds. If your bank is in trouble, that's no problem. You go to another bank. What you see here is very different. What you see here is the black line are the firms who have links to weak firms, to weak banks. Firms that have links to weak banks have seen employment drop by 20%. They've lost 20% of their employees. Whereas firms that have links to strong banks have lost 10% of their employees. So if you have a bad bank, you're a cafe, and your, machine, your cafe machine breaks, okay? you want a new coffee machine, and you go to the bank, and they say, well, we are a weak bank, we're in trouble, we don't want to give loans. Normally, you would think, well, this is a good restaurant, it has good you know, clients, they should be able to go to another bank and get another loan. What this research shows is that they don't. They fire the employees and close the coffee, the, the cafe. Okay? I have a paper that uh, Marco very kindly referred to in which I show with Claudia Steinwander, also from LSE, that Spanish firms are getting hurt. That if you compare a Spanish firm owned by a Spanish, a Spanish company owned by Spanish capital with a Spanish company owned by foreigners, the Spanish companies owned by Spanish capital have much larger drops in employment, much larger drops in innovation. It's the first column. Okay? It's being a Spanish firm means your employment is dropping by 6% more, your uh, wage bill is dropping by 4% more, you're increasing prices because you are against the wall, you're trying to kind of get your consumers, extract as much of them from, as possible, which means they're quitting as well. Um, being Spanish is a course. This is true for Italian firms as well. Okay? If you buy a Fiat, a Fiat is today cheaper than a comparable Volkswagen. Okay? But if you actually buy the Fiat and you get a loan to finance the car, Volkswagen will give you a zero interest loan. Fiat will not be able to give you a zero interest loan because Fiat is borrowing at 300 basis points more than Volkswagen. Okay? So the Volkswagen buyer is, is getting an advantage from the fact that Germany, the, bank, the German banks, and as a result, the German companies, is able to borrow at much cheaper rates. The Spanish or the Italian company is getting a big disadvantage from the fact that the Spanish and the Italian banks are weak and cannot give those companies those loans. This is undeniable. Okay? In fact, I think there is a lot of evidence that not only Germany hasn't been paying, I'm not anti-German, and very pro-German, I think they've done a lot. But the truth of the matter is, in this crisis, not only have they not paid the cost for the crisis, but Germany has actually benefited from the crisis by being able to borrow both at the state level and at the company level much more cheaply than it could have otherwise. Okay? Because people are taking their money away and putting it in Germany. So 
I think the link in all of these countries between that we are doing research on it, uh, we're trying to get our hands dirty, looking at the data carefully, etc. Um, my sense is that the connection between the banking problem and the economic problems that we see is increasingly clear. Credit is not flowing. If credit doesn't flow, the economies cannot grow again. Look at the uh, industrial production indexes. The recession is getting uh, stronger. Non-performing loans are growing, so the banks are getting in even bigger trouble. Uh, there, are, there is progress, okay? I don't want to deny there is progress. The maturity of the loans is uh, reducing. People are paying back some of the loans. The principal is, is being reduced, but there are problems. Are we seeing in the policy debate real measures to break this loop? Are we seeing that Europe is saying, look, we created the union, doesn't work. The blot, okay, funding, finance is the blot of, this, of the economic system. If the money doesn't circulate, the finance doesn't circulate, everything kind of dries off. Are we seeing action? My sense is that the measures we are seeing are not enough. It's good that there's been big progress in the funding of the states. It's good that if you go to the streets, if you're an economist now, in May or June last year, all your friends were asking you, should I take my money out? Okay, I don't know if you had this experience. I mean, in Spain, last May, last June, everybody would ask me, should I take my money out of the euro? Should I put it in Germany? Should I take it out of Spanish banks? Now, this is gone. Okay? So the sense of tragedy, the sense of immediate crisis, the immediate explosion is gone. But I don't think we're doing nearly enough to break this loop that I was telling you about. The banking union is a low-cost banking union in which a lot of the change must happen before the banking union. What basically Europe is telling to the states is, look, before we do the banking union, you clean up your mess and then we'll do the banking union. The problem is we are saying the states, that sounds all great, okay? Yeah, you clean up your mess, don't bring the mess to me, sure. But I don't have the resources to clean up my mess, okay? Um, so I'll pass the recapitalization in Spain. Uh, it's too detailed for, for what I want to say now. Just to say that um, the recapitalization is insufficient and we have a lot of weak banks that are not being able to lend and this is struggling the recovery. Um, so let me just give you a sense of how things are. The state, and this the graph for Italy and for Spain is very, very much the same. The state is able to have much better access to funding than in July. You see that it has materially improved. Um, and private banks are also able to get back to the, to, the, to the market. What you don't see is that this is helping households and companies. And let me show you two pieces of evidence. This is data as of right now, okay? This is what's happening today. The green is Euribor. Euribor is low. Interest rates are low, okay? But that doesn't help you if you want to mortgage, get a mortgage. That doesn't help you if you want to get your cafeteria to buy a new coffee machine. Mortgage rates are totally decoupled, okay? Before, mortgage rates and Euribor will move together. Now, the blue... Sorry, these were SMEs. Sorry, mortgage is going to be the next. The small and medium enterprise loans, the coffee owner. If you look at that graph, what you see is he sees the Euribor is really low. And he says, great, now I can finance myself. But then he goes for a loan and they tell him, no, no, no. You have to pay over 5% for this loan. The spread is very big. Notice, this is while inflation is dropping. So the real interest rate, the effort he has to, to make to pay this loan is huge, okay? So this coffee owner in Spain and in Italy is not able to benefit from these big new policies that we saw, and nor is really the households who want to buy a house, the young people who want to get a mortgage. The blue again, now it's mortgage rates, the green is Euribor, and you see the decoupling. Before the crisis, these two things move, move together. Now one goes down, the other one doesn't, and the reason it doesn't is not monetary policy, is not fiscal policy, 
is the problems with the banking system. We're all a bit distracted talking about austerity and talking about uh, monetary policy. The real problem is, in my opinion, the banking problems. This was a financial crisis to start with. It's still a financial crisis. The banking problems haven't been solved. Um, let me just quickly talk about the two, the three kind of extra problems, just quickly, that we saw emerge over the decade. What we saw over the decade of the bubble was a big loss in competitiveness for all the periphery countries. We saw a big increase in leverage, as we saw, an increase in debt. But we also saw problems with institutions, problems with human capital, and problems with finance, as we said before. The competitiveness problem in, in Spain, for example, is really changing. Okay? Labor market, the pressure on the labor market is very large. There's a lot of unemployment. Unit labor costs are dropping. Unit labor cost means how much does it cost you to produce a unit of output? It costs you less than before. Okay? So competitiveness problems are on the way to being improved. Um, the leveraging problems, there is some improvement. The debt is dropping a bit. But during the crisis, some of these countries had problems that are very, very deep. Let me tell you one problem that Spain had that Italy happily didn't have. Not much happened in Italy in the last decade. Okay? Italy didn't grow. Okay? That's not a great thing. But it's probably better than growing in the way Spain grew. Spain grew by putting a lot of bricks. Okay? Productivity didn't grow. What changed was there was all this free money. People use it to buy lots of houses and try to become rich by buying houses and getting mortgages and all that. Look at this graph. What it says is that the blue line is how many Spanish kids dropped out of high school. And what it shows you is that at the start of the Euro project, at the start of the single market, that was as bad as Italy. Big dropout rate. 40% of the kids didn't finish high school. Now, over time, that was dropping. And look at Spain and Italy. It's dropping the same way. Until 97, the green and the blue line are the same. And then something happens in 98 or 99. Spain's dropout rate stops improving. The kids don't want to finish high school. What are they doing? It's not, it's not very difficult to imagine. Okay? We have a lot of evidence they went to the construction sector. Why would you stay in school? You could earn three or four thousand euros, you know, on this big bubble that had come from the whole financing boom. So the financing boom has had a big permanent consequence for Spain, which is the human capital deterioration. Um, the housing excesses, which I won't go into, uh, were also uh, tricky. And I wanted to make a point about institutions, because I don't want to say, look, all the problems are Germany and our countries don't have anything to, to deal with. Spain, Italy, Greece and Portugal, particularly also Ireland, do have a serious problem to address in institutions. And my view is that the euro had a very negative effect on institutions. And the negative effect it had was, it's like an anesthesia. Interest rates were low. Money was cheap, and that meant you didn't have to solve any problem. This is true for Italy. It was true for Spain. So a source of persistence of that loop that I showed you before, one consequence of that loop is that because funding was very easy and a lot of money came in, what we've had, credit boom, has led through to institutional deterioration. Every town hall, every savings banks, every city, every public organism could just borrow very cheaply. Okay? They didn't need to do the hard work of thinking how to run places, how to select the best managers, etc. So in my opinion, and this is uh, some work that uh, I'm publishing in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, if somebody wants to see more, there is a Vox EU about it. Um, a big consequence of the whole boom 
is we now have to do the house cleaning, we have to get the institutional housing in order. So I think growth in the longer term is not solving the problems of the banks, that's important to save the euro, but in the longer term, growth is not going to happen without institutional reform in Spain, in Italy, in all these other countries. So I want to finish by, um, I want to finish by, um, and, and then have a, have a longer discussion with you, by talking about what can we do to break this loop, okay? So let me just summarize the argument until now, give you a sense of what we, uh, of what I think we understand and tell you what are the suggestions for change, the road ahead. So what the argument I've made is this. We created a banking union that is a financial integration that is incomplete. We get the worst of all worlds. We are financially integrated, which means money goes to the place where there were big hot money flows from one country to the other. But we're not sufficiently financially integration, integrated because then the problems are not observed by everybody, absorbed by everybody together. They are absorbed by the individual country. And the individual country doesn't have the ability to solve these big problems. Okay. So financial integration was done, if you want, in, in the worst of all worlds. It was done in a way that it accentuated the problems that we all know can come with capital mobility. You do get the capital mobility in the good times, we're all together. Oh, you can have all my money. In the bad times, sorry, you're on your own. Now you need the money, now you can't have it. Okay? So, we created a banking union that had at least two crucial things missing. Look at my graph. The banks in California don't have as their main asset loans to the California government. That would be crazy. The banks in California have United States government debt. When California is in trouble, the banks are not scared because they have U.S. government debt. The banks in Greece, however, they held mostly Greek government debt. When the Greek government was in trouble, when there was a haircut, all the Greek banks were under. In fact, even the Cy Cyprus banks were under because they also were Greek, uh, strong Greek government debt. That's the top. The bottom says when the Phoenix, Arizona bank, the California bank, the New Mexico bank is in trouble, it doesn't go to the state government for help because it would drag the state government down. They absorb the losses together. So those are the two things. We created a union without two extremely important legs. Okay? And the question is, are we ready to put those two legs back? The banks are the responsibility of the union and the borrowing, the, the instruments that the banks use as collateral is not their bonds of Italy for the Italian banks and the bonds of Greece for the Greek banks. The instruments the banks use as collateral are the, the bonds of the whole union so that they don't drag each other down. Okay. My answer is not quite. Okay? Not quite. And I want to show you why. Um, I want to make three suggestions for what would be needed what, what would be needed and i'm going to argue that we are not advancing sufficiently in them it can happen there is some progress okay i'm not going to tell you that we are doomed and uh, the euro is dead or anything i think a lot of the bad scenarios have been ruled out but we haven't done the homework to solve this problem and i'm going to show you why first point the legacy debt so the banks we made a mess the first thing you need to do is to clean up the mess that we had. Because as long as this overhang is there, the economy cannot start. The problem of the overhang is if the bank is scared that it's about to fall down, it won't start lending. It will be trying to collect as much money as possible to, to survive. Okay? So the debt overhang is important. That's what affects the growth. That's what leads to the lower arrow on growth. So the first thing you need to do is some partial mutualization. You need to say, look, we made a mistake, we made it all together, we're going to clean it up all together. Did this happen? No. Okay? We've done what I'm calling here a banking union on the chip. Uh, the idea is the legacy debt will be absorbed by the member states. Um, 
the countries in the north don't want to recognize that there was a common problem, that we designed some institutions wrong, and that we have to deal with it together. I understand why, okay? I understand why. Here's what they answer, okay? Suppose I tell this in Germany, okay, which I have done. What will a German person tell you? Well, think of yourself. You're the banker and you have a shopkeeper. The shopkeeper comes to you and says, oh, sorry, you know, you gave me these loans, I can't repay them. But if you pardon me the loans, next time I really will repay them. Mm, it doesn't sound that great, right? The bank is going to say, oh, sure. That's what you tell me now, and in 10 years you tell me again. Okay, the Germans say, you're calling it legacy now. You want help for the legacy today. Then you'll, do, you'll go back. Once we help you, you'll go back, spend again, blah, blah, blah. And then you'll say, oh, it's legacy. You have to help us. Okay? They don't trust us. Okay? They don't trust that this will be a one-off recap. So instead, what they're saying is, is your problem. You clean up the banks. In the future, we'll have a banking union, which will work better. But today, you clean up the banks. The problem is, how much can our countries take? How much can Italy, Spain, and Greece, how big can low can unemployment get? How high can youth unemployment get? How much will things, will people be able to solve these problems on their own if they are left, you know, people, once people look at it and realize, well, we have five, eight, ten years of low growth, of no growth, and it's a really difficult future to try to solve these problems. Can countries really deal with it on their own? Can it possibly happen? Um, I don't know. I mean, things are peaceful. There is no riots in the streets. Uh, even in Spain with 27% unemployment, I would say you might see some things on TV, but the truth of the matter is most people are pretty quiet considering the situation. So I don't think we can get out of the uh, without some mutualization. Mutualization means we pay the mess together. We made a mess together. As a union, we pay the mess together. Second, my second point is how do we break the sovereigns to the banks? It cannot be that the Italian banks, the main asset they have is Italian debt. And the reason I've made this point, I hope it's clear by now to you, is when the Italian state gets wobbly, the banks get wobbly. But since the Italian state is the only thing behind the banks, then the state gets even more wobbly, and we are back to the trouble. So that cannot be. How do you solve it? You have to force the banks to carry joint European Union debt, a joint borrowing instrument. Now, we all understand a euro bond is very far into the future, okay? For everybody to have the same bond, everybody has to trust each other because otherwise you're going to go out and borrow a lot and then let me the bill, okay? I have an apartment, we are four roommates, and we say we're all going to have the same bank account. But I have this roommate who we all know is a little bit, you know, uh, he likes to drink. And I'm afraid that with my bank account, he goes out drinking and then he comes back and says, well, it's all together, it's the joint, it's the joint loan. So it's going to be very hard to get a joint borrowing instrument. Instead, what I have proposed with this group, Euronomics, is a securitized instrument. The European Debt Agency, which is a new agency that you would create, would buy sovereign bonds. It would buy Italian bonds, it would buy German bonds, it would like buy Portuguese bonds. It would put them in a package, okay? It would buy them in fixed proportions. It wouldn't be rescuing. It would be in fixed proportions. It would buy German. It would buy a whole package. It would make a cake with them. And it would sell two tranches of the cake. It would sell junior bonds and senior bonds. The junior bonds would be the first ones to collapse. If one of the countries collapses, then those people who have junior bonds will absorb the losses. There wouldn't be rescues. But the banks would hold those senior bonds, which would be protected. There is no bailout here. There is no bailout. There is joint borrowing without joint liability. What's the advantage? The advantage is the liquidity premium that the German banks get whenever everybody in Italy panics, or the German state gets when everybody in Italy panics. Now it would go to those senior bonds, which everybody together issues. 
Um, so I think it does break, it helps to break the diabolic loop. It breaks one of the branches of the diabolic loop and it, by forcing the banks to not borrow from their own treasuries. Why are the banks so crazy that they borrow from their own treasuries? The reason banks borrow from their own treasuries is twofold. Why today Italian banks have so much Italian debt? Why today do Spanish banks have so much Spanish debt? There are two reasons. Reason one is the treasury minister gives them a call and says, you have to buy this. Okay? Full stop. And since they are the ones who are supporting you, you do what they say. The second is a little bit more complicated, but very interesting, which is the bank thinks, look, if we default, we're dead anyway. Okay? So we might as well. Okay? They're giving you a, 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 banking, a, a loan, you're buying an asset from the state. You think if the state... If the Italian state fails, the banking system is going to be in tatters. So what's the problem with buying more and more Italian debt? But of course, that makes it more likely that the Italian state fails. So with this solution, you wouldn't have that. The Italian banks would buy this European Union debt, and they would not be linked in this loop. The third and last issue I wanted to raise is the new resolution regime on the banking union. Um, so we are, I want to, I mean, this is the main thing that is happening in Europe now. The main thing that is happening in Europe now is we are creating a banking union, okay? We are creating a banking union. So if you go back to my loop, we are creating a banking union. Given all I said, you would be very happy because that means when the banks fail, they're not the responsibility of Italy, they're the responsibility of Frankfurt, if they fail, this loop is broken, okay? Nothing more can affect the Italian state. So that means all of this trouble we are in stops, starts evaporating, and we start going into a better world. The problem is the, the banking union we are now putting together, it's a bit lame. It's a bit lame in a predictable way. A banking union has three legs, okay? Think of it as a stool with three legs, a chair, okay? Where it has three legs. Leg one is supervision, okay? There is one guy in Frankfurt who looks at all the banks and says, this bank is good, this bank is bad. That's great, okay? You need that. We are going to have that leg. That's pretty clear, okay? There is a treaty signed December on time, sorry, an agreement uh, reached in December of 2012 on time, and that agreement says by March or April 2014, we will have a single supervisor. But there are two more legs. And the two more legs I have there. Resolution. What does resolution mean? Resolution is very simple. It means if the regulator says this bank is bad, it can close the bank. And the bank is going to take off some money to recapitalize, it's going to be sold off, some of the bonds of the bank are going to be worth nothing, etc. You need a resolution mechanism. But notice, there is a sound here to money. You cannot close the money bank for free resolution mechanism is going to need some money. When you close a bank, you know, you need to, there is some people who might lose money, you need, you need to put some money there. Maybe as a bridge loan, maybe you're going to make a lot of people pay, but you have depositors that you have to insure. So there are two legs of that stool that you need. You need a resolution mechanism and a deposit insurance. Let me be clear, this is not in the cards. There is no deposit insurance intention at all, okay? Deposit insurance will happen in the future that nobody can imagine. There is nobody in Europe talking about deposit insurance. Nobody in Northern Europe. So you, your state is responsible for your deposits. Resolution is the big place where there is now an open question. How centralized the resolution authority Will it have some money to, 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 to make, uh, to, make so, to, to solve the problems? We don't know. I don't want to go into the detail right now. If it comes up in the q and I'll be happy to go to the Resolution Authority. But the bottom line is, of the three legs of Banking Union, the only leg that we have agreed is surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, the one that doesn't cost any money. The single supervisor that doesn't require any transfers. So we are still confronting this wall which is we do lots of things as long as no money is involved. When the fiscal transfer is necessary, we crash against the wall. 
can the euro be saved? I think we created a monetary union without sufficient economic union and without sufficient banking supervision, integration, and res common resolution. And what that means is that it's a banking union that is it's a monetary union that is lame, that doesn't stand on its legs, and it's only going to be safe, and in fact, it's only worth saving if we are ready, and in this case, southern countries need to do a lot with their institutions, northern countries need to start facing up to the fact that there are costs involved. And if we're not willing to incur the costs, then it's neither possible nor probably worth it to save it. Thanks very much. I think Professor Garicano has been crystal clear in his presentation. He raised a number of issues. I jotted down a few notes and I have some questions myself, but before asking those questions, I'd like to see whether there are questions from the floor. Please. Short questions so that we can have more answers. La domanda la può fare in italiano, sì, sì. Dunque, io volevo chiedere, mi sembra di aver capito... We think we should centralize the liability for debts in Europe, as it is also already a truism in the US. My question is as follows. Is there a limit to the debt we can create? Because the European Union obviously may issue more guarantees than Italy or Spain can do individually, but over time, uh, the debt for the European Union uh, has to have some kind of ceiling. And then the US, even the federal debt, is creating problems. I'd like to know what you think about it, about the potential amount of European debt. debt as in the United States, but there will be limit to this debt because even in a centralized debt, the debt it can be a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think the comparison between the US and Europe is very instructive. Um, it's a bit hot. I don't know if we can open a door and get some air. Huh? Yeah, it would be nice, right? I mean, I'm, I'm cooking. I'm going to start uh, evaporating. Um, that would be pretty cool to see. Uh, grazie. Um, um, so, the, the, um, the, limits, uh, the limits, the comparison between the US and Europe is very interesting, um, but I think we have to recognize political realities. Would it be better if we had a fiscal union? You know, at some point in the United States, they had a debt crisis um, just after independence, and uh, there is a famous Hamilton compromise where Hamilton basically had the southern, here the south was rich and the north was poor, okay? So the southern states accepted to take over the northern states' lo uh, uh, debt in exchange for moving the capital from New York to the south to Washington DC, which is in Virginia, as you know. I mean, it was, no, it's its, its own state. And by moving the capital to the south and accepting a centralization of power. I don't think that's realistic. I mean, I don't think we're going to see um, a European public opinion come up simply because we all speak different languages. I wish I could be talking to you in Italian today. Um, but it's just, it's just difficult. So we're going to have to find ways that are, we invent our own creatures. We're not going to have the same as Europe, as the US. But Europe has always been a different thing. It's never been a state. It's never been an association. It's always been something we've been created as we go along. We Europeans know what the alternative is. The alternative is going back to disintegration, going back to populism, going back to permanent crisis. We don't want that. I think Europe is the solution. I am a huge, firm believer in Europe. But Europe, 
for Europe to be the solution, Europe is going to have to go some way. I don't think towards a full fiscal union, but some way towards a fiscal union, including the banking, maybe including some joint insurance for unemployment insurance, unemployment programs that maybe now we see uh, some movement. I was saying this morning, somebody was, was interviewing me in the, in the radio in the square, which I thought was a very cool thing. E por si muove, okay? It does move, okay? Europe is moving. It's not huge, but we do see progress. It's not fast enough, but it does happen. Okay. Uh, prego. Adesso pigliamo due o tre domande. Now we're going to take a few questions altogether. Schöbler, in one of his statements, has said that Germans are for the single surveillance mechanism, but they don't want a guarantee for deposits up until 100,000 in euro at a European level. They don't want this guarantee because they see it as a chosen horse uh, to the disadvantage of the German taxpayer. So what I ask is, is the follow is the following. Uh, those who pay when the bank goes uh, um, bankrupt are those that have deposits or those who have the shares of that bank. but. Don't you think we should have a resolution of banks with bonds and uh, bad loans internationally? Would there be a, a guarantee for deposits up until 100,000 euro? Don't you think that we have to do our homework first and then uh, satisfy the requirements of the Germans? So let's do our homework first. But my question is as follows. Should we Re resolve the banks uh, with these uh, bad debts. Uh, would there be any guarantee for the deposits up until 100,000 euro? And then one last consideration. There were many local banks, uh, the Cajas in, the, in Spain, that uh, lent money. And then they have developed banks that are too big to fail. And and then the money from the EU went to the state. So the state ra basically raised uh, the debt. So I think that the services of the citizens should be paid for by the state. The state should, is not there just to pay and bail out the bank for the banks. So there's a lady and there's a gentleman first. Thank you. I have two questions. First. Euro crisis and financial crisis that was triggered in the US. What is the relationship? A number of economists, Italian economists as well, stated that the euro has been a risk because the European Union is not, uh, would not be an uh, ideal common currency area, so much so that imbalances and inequalities would be created. Do you think that without the euro we would have had the crisis anyway? Do you think that the crisis caused by the US uh, has been a triggering uh, element for our crisis but not the main cause? I understand that there's a big pro political problem. Europe is not progressing as fast as we want it to do. The European ruling classes and I'm saying Italian, Italian ruling class is terrible, but the others are not so much better. And the Germans are not ready to pay for the others. Don't we have to have a big pl plan? So rather than looking at the collapse of the euro, don't you think that we should have another kind of exit solutions? Thank you. The gentleman at the back. Lee. In the definition of the banking union, what about the role of the European Central Bank? Because often we wonder about that. What is the role of the ECB going to be if a monetary union is set up? Will it print money? We answer these questions and then accept an additional three. Um, so, uh, three questions. Uh, the first one on the recap and the deposit insurance and who's going to take care of the deposits. I think uh, 
the experiment with letting the uninsured, the insured depositors absorb losses is not going to be repeated. I don't think that's going to happen, meaning the below 100,000 will be safe. In how? Um, good question. Uh, I think that they will be safe. Uh, I think that um, the risks are too large, and I think the European Central Bank, if necessary, would step in below 100,000. Above 100,000, um, I think the story is different. Uh, because you were mentioning the recap of the cajas, etc., and you said, well, people can absorb some of the losses, and the truth is, yeah, they can absorb. So here's how the recap ca happened in Spain. Basically, there were what is called subordinated liability exercises, which means everybody who had subordinated debt, so no depositors lost any money in Spain. The people who lost money were the people who held subordinated shares and preference uh, loans to the banks, okay? So the preference and subordinated debt holders were not quite wiped out, but they lost quite a little bit of money. <laughs> Basically, 12.7 billion was raised from them. 12.7, that's my number two. The state put another 37 billion, okay? So there has been a 50 billion recap, 37 from the state, 17.12.7 from the banks. And then there was a bad bank that was created uh, with a net asset value of 50 billion, okay? 5% uh, of GDP is 50 billion, okay? One point of GDP is 10 billion. So essentially a 50 billion bad bank and a 50 billion recap of which 12 billion were put by the, by the, by the uh, shareholder, by debt holders of the banks. I think that's where we're going. We're going to increase in differentiation between all the classes of people who hold capital in the banks. I think the shareholders will be the first to be wiped out, the preference holders, and then probably there is a big issue between the senior debt holders, the bond holders, meaning, and the deposits, the uninsured depositors who will go first. I think that they probably will take the bond holders first and then the uninsured depositors. I don't think they want to repeat what happened in Cyprus. So that's, I think, where we're going. Um, this, the problem is, this is the right solution. The right solution is the private money goes in first. For sure, everybody agrees with that. Okay. There are two disagreements. One is Europe has not wanted the bondholders to take any hit. That's wrong. Bondholders should pay as well. And second is Europe should be ready to step in before the individual member states. And the reason that happens, and the reason I, I don't agree with the point, well, we should do our clean our house before Europe comes in, is very practical. I don't think the member states have the financial ability to do that on their own. Second question on what would a European crisis would have happened anyway without uh, the euro? because of the financial crisis. There was a financial crisis. We would have had a financial crisis anywhere. I don't have that graph here. You can see my, my working paper on, on the Journal of Economics Perspective that's coming soon. But when the euro came in, liquidity would have, happened, would have been more available to all countries because there was a period of excessively loose liquidity. We all agree with that. But the credit bubble on the credit markets of Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, would not have been as big if the euro hadn't been there. And the way to see it is very simple. Look at the differential between the credit, the rates, the interest rates that Europe, that uh, Germany was paying and that Italy or Greece were paying. In 2002, Greece paid the same to borrow as Germany. People thought it's the same euro, so it's the same debt, like in the US, it's federal debt. They don't realize, they didn't realize that Greek debt is Greeks. It's Greece's, it's not the unions. So there wouldn't have been as big a financial bubble, for sure. I mean, this is undoubtable. The interest rates wouldn't have dropped as much, people wouldn't have gone in as much trouble in Greece, Spain, Italy, etc., borrowing for the public and the private sectors without the euro. So yes, the euro had a lot to do with that crisis. Um, the third question was, what's the role of the ECB in all of this? Uh, excuse me, no, just a moment. There was a, the second part of the question of the lady was if, if we should prepare a B plan, a way out, given the fact that the political situation in Europe is so difficult. Well, I was trying to avoid B plans. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to talk about B plans. Um, 
I don't really, I don't see a B plan. I mean, we are faced with a path. We are in the, you know, this guy who was, you know, in the K2, and uh, no, in the Dabla uh, Hari last week, and he died. He had a, an injury, and he couldn't be taken out. I mean, we're in the mountain. We're in a, a very steep slope, and we can just kind of walk down slowly the mountain we climbed. Just the idea of, okay, then we jump down from the mountain. If we forget about it, I don't think it's going to work. Okay? If you try to jump down from the mountain, you're going to crash. So I think we scrambled this omelette pretty well, which is the euro. And we're not going to be able to unscramble it. Um, I think the euro, a priori, has a lot of advantages. Um, it has, we create a level playing field for all companies. Uh, but all the advantages require that the monetary union works. I mean, there's no level playing field. The fiat cannot borrow because it's Italian. So we need to fix it. Um, I don't really see the alternative. One obvious alternative is that Germany exits. Germany exits, the euro becomes cheaper, it depreciates, um, it becomes weaker, we get more inflation. Germany would be fine because they would pay their euro debts much more cheaply. They would be happy. Well, they would have to export at a more expensive rate, but all the, all the loans they had would be repaid in cheap currency. And for the rest of the countries, it would also be easier. But I don't think that's doable. Um, and the reason I don't think it's doable is because the euro is, at the end of the day, a political process, project, and um, I don't think Germany would leave. So I think the best we can do is just um, keep pushing for the best solution we can find. Question. Third question was on the ECB's role. It's really weird, right? The European Central Bank is the only European institution we have, the only one that can make decisions without compromises. The result of this is the European Central Bank is the sovereign in Europe. We have an emperor, Emperor Draghi. We're in the Roman times. He says, I don't like that labor regulation, you know? And there's a secret letter to the prime minister that says the labor regulation has to go. Okay? That's stunning. I mean, we're back to Rome. We have this person who is unaccountable, unelected. It's not because he's bad. He's trying to solve things. It's because he's the only one who has the power to make decisions without anybody having all these uh, countries trying to agree. I mean, just think that Italy, instead of having a central government, the way you run Italy was by having all the regions get together and decide what they were going to do. I, mean, I don't think Italy would, would really get to any decision. That's what, how it works in Europe. So the ECB is working by default. This is not a solution anybody likes. And I bet you the, the ones who like it least are the ECB. They don't like to be the facto, the government of Europe, deciding which country survives, which country dies. Italy, Ireland went bankrupt the day the European Central Bank told them, either you seek a rescue or we're pulling the plug. Greece, Cyprus, the same thing. The problem, the, the, the rescue was triggered by the European Central Bank saying, it's over. We're not allowing your banks to continue getting this blood supply from us. So right now, the fact that the government of Europe is some gentleman who is very smart, happily, and well-intentioned, but he's sitting in his office in Frankfurt without any accountability. That's not desirable. And we need to have a much better solution, which is that Europe sets the institutions that it needs. Grazie. Prego. Grazie. In your contribution, you presented a number of possible uh, solutions to the crisis or way out from the crisis. And given the difficulty of mutualization of credit and euro bonds, you t talked about junior and senior bonds. Would you please dwell upon that? How do you identify junior bonds? How long does it take for them to become senior bonds, etc.? Good afternoon. You said that a growth recovery also requires institutional reforms. My question is, what about uh, the significance of uh, a real political integration in this difficult moment? So a situation where uh, countries, states, uh, 
renounced to part of their sovereignty, also at political level without having a system where somebody prevails over the others, as is the case with Germany at the moment. The uh, diabolic uh, loop that uh, you have described so well, it's just a part uh, of a bigger problem. I mean, the Eurozone crisis qualifies it itself as a uh, ba balance of payment crisis, right? I mean, sudden stops in, uh, in the peripheral countries, etc., etc. Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether we are not, we are focusing, you know, we are focusing our efforts on uh, a, a small problem. I mean, the, the true problem is uh, mm, to address is the balance of payment problem. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, how can we fix the, this problem? And uh, I think that uh, the institution of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure uh, at the end of uh, uh, 2011, it's, it's uh, a first step, but uh, we, we should make um, the, the mechanism within it uh, more, um, I mean, more, more binding for, especially for surplus can countries, and I mean, I think that the solution is not to find uh, 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 fiscal transfers, for example, but to find a coordination between countries. So, I mean, if uh, s uh, southern countries uh, are now tightening uh, on the fiscal side, I mean, austerity, I think that uh, surplus country, countries should uh, have expansionary measure. So, it's coordination and not uh, something as a fiscal transfer. And, and this is not only for public finances, I, th I think in uh, okay. every part of the economy. Thank you, Adam. Please. Um, okay, so junior bonds. Explain junior bonds and senior bonds. Okay. The European Debt Agency buys loans from all countries. Okay. And this is what it buys. Okay. These are all the loans, this piece of paper. It says, um, We've bought um, we've bought in our asset side, we have all these sovereign bonds we've bought. We've bought bonds from Portugal, and we've put them all in a box. Okay, they're all in a box. There's a shoe box with all of these bonds. So we issue a piece of paper that says, here, instead of you buying the loans from Portugal, you buy this, which is the loans from Portugal, from Germany, etc. But instead of issuing one piece of paper, it issues two, this and this. This has a J and this has an S. This is a junior bond and this is a senior bond. It goes to the people and says, hey, do you want the junior bond or a senior bond? And tells people, look, the junior bond is great. It pays 10% interest rate. It's pretty good, but it has a problem. If any of these countries falls, you're going to lose money. Okay? The first 30% of the emission of losses is absorbed by this paper. If he buys this paper, it's good for him. But he's going to get good interest rates, 10%. But if any country fails, he's in trouble because some of this paper will go to the trash. Okay? If he buys this paper, this has an S. It's a senior bond. This paper says it's safe. Okay? There will have to be three or four countries collapsing before you would lose any money. Normally, it will have to be Italy and Spain. Normally, this paper is very safe, okay? But I'm sorry, you get a very cheap, a very safe paper. It only pays 2%, okay? So you can choose which one you get. Now, what's the good things of this? The good thing of this is if you want risk, you have the piece of paper you can absorb, that you can, you can take if you're somebody who can absorb risk. If you're a bank or a pension fund and you don't want any risk because you're obliged to invest in safe assets or whatever, you get this other one. But we don't not need now to go around and bail out the banks, because now the banks are holding these safe assets. And if somebody bought these assets, we can tell them, look, it's your problem. You wanted the 10% interest rate, you got this paper, now it has a haircut, another haircut. Sorry, that's what it's worth now. Until you get all of these haircuts, until this moment, the other person is safe. And there is a lot of losses that have to happen for this paper to be worth zero. Okay? That's the junior and the senior bonds. Notice, there is no bailouts here. That's the key. The capitalism 
Capitalism only works under one condition. You take your risks. If it goes well, you're going to be rich. If it goes badly, you are in trouble. Okay? Capitalism doesn't work if we tell people who invest, oh, if it works, great for you. And it doesn't work, no worry, we'll take the losses. Hello? I mean, call that socialism for the rich. Okay? Socialism for the rich is a crazy idea. It doesn't work because it means that people are going to go around making crazy investments and then they go around saying, sorry. You know, you see Morgan, JP Morgan in London, a month ago or a couple of months ago, there was a report from the Senate Committee of the US where they found that JP Morgan was doing exactly the same things as before the crisis, getting all the depositors' money and betting it on the casino. If it works, Good. If it's bad, sorry, depositor, uh, uh, the depositors are in trouble, the state should help them. Second, institutional reform with real political integration. You know what? The Germans want it. Who was asking me this? The lady. Okay. The Germans want it. The Germans are the only country where there is today a political, active political debate about getting democracy, democracy and accountability in Europe. Because they realize that a situation where they are the bosses, we, we did all this union to tie Germany down, and instead what we have created is a union where only Germany decides. That's crazy. So they realize that's not sustainable, and they want a union. They want a true political union. The problem is, I don't know that the other countries would want it. I mean, people, the more we advance, the more people are disappointed with Europe, the less they want to hear about it. Third and last question, balance of payment. Is this a balance of payment or is this a financial crisis? I really do think it's a financial crisis at the root. Do I believe Spain and Italy have a competitiveness problems? Absolutely, certainly. Do I believe they have a deficit? Sure, but you know what? Today, March 2013, last numbers, they came yesterday or today in Spain. Spain is in a current account surplus for the first time since the series exists. In the whole history of Spain, there had never been in a current account surplus. Does it mean the crisis is over? Does it mean financing is coming? No. I mean, there is a problem for sure on the macro side, but I really do think, and I think competitiveness is important, structural reforms are important, our economies are kind of in big trouble and they need to be loosened up. But the euro is going to live or die depending on whether we are able to solve the financial crisis that we face. That's my view. And I think the evidence supports it, um, as I showed you some of the papers that are supporting that. I think we are uh, probably yeah, at the end. No, I think uh, we can get one or two more questions because we have 10 minutes. I have to go to Milan or uh, Yes, just, just five minutes. Please. Four thirty, it's okay for you? Hi. Okay. Hello. Uh, Seven thirty. Okay. Coming from uh, US, as you were talking about the union and everything, I think uh, I see some uh, differences between the United States of Europe and the United States of America as we have. First of all, I see the cultural barriers that exist here, which I think are extremely difficult to eliminate over the period of time. Secondly, what are your views on the target imbalances that exist here? Because usually people don't talk about that. Secondly, as you mentioned uh, in your plan about the junior and the senior debt uh, agency, I suspect if it would be able to work as you are proposing, because what is the incentive for the German bonds, for the German government to pool their bonds into this debt agency, because they already have such a low interest that they have to pay. And secondly, just two case scenarios, as some of the people were mentioning, the plan A and the plan B. Do you think with the current policies, 10 years of recession, or is it better that some damage happens now and some countries go out of the monetary union. Okay. Uh, I would say that we do not accept more questions. The very last one. Proposal that I find very interesting of the European Debt Agency. When you answer this question, please. La mia domanda è differente. Lei dà per scontato che la Germania. I have a different question. You take for granted that Germany remains in Europe. Let's assume that in September the Germans say we want to exit uh, the Union. Well, all the other member states, will, will, would they be able to support the Euro or not? On your questions, I indeed didn't talk about target imbalances. Uh, 
the target imbalances were exploding. Basically, the target imbalances, just to put it very, very quickly, what was happening was, normally, if you want to buy an Audi, you get a loan from your bank, uh, your bank is getting a deposit for somebody else, it lends you the Audi. At some point, Italian banks and Spanish banks basically couldn't get anybody to lend them money, so basically they were taking the loan to lend you the Audi, they were actually taking the, the loan to the European Central Bank, and the European Central Bank was basically lending the money to the, to the, to the Italian banks. So in fact, you were being lent the money to other, the Audi by the German Central Bank in some sense. That was, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. Um, the target imbalances problem, I think, has been largely addressed by Draghi's very strong statement of commitment to the euro. That's magic, right? It's really amazing. He announced a program. He didn't put the program in place. He didn't really say this OMT, these outright monetary transactions, would actually happen. In fact, they are tricky because they need political conditions. But just the fact that he said, believe me, it will be enough, was enough. People did believe him, and the problem kind of went away. Um, it will maybe come back when there is the next uh, stage of the crisis. Agency problems, will Germany want these things to happen? Yes, there are agency problems, but you know what? Germany, I think, is very aware of how weak and tricky its position is. And the reason the position is weak is because it's so strong. Because, you know, when you are basically making decisions for, for the whole continent, you know you're going to create resentment and you know that you need allies. And so I think Germany would be willing to consider. Uh, that is linked to what's the chance for the European Debt Agency. I presented those ideas at the, at the International Monetary Fund, at the French, at the Germans, uh, the French Central Bank, at the Dutch Central Bank, at many places. My sense is that um, there are a lot of people who are receptive. Uh, in the IMF, for example, there was a lot of sympathy to these ideas when we presented it. Some of my colleagues, as I was saying, presented it at other places. Um, but it has to be a moment of desperate crisis for these kind of changes. It's a bit what was said about fiscal policy union. I mean, you need a whole package. You need a moment where we say, look, this thing is just not getting better. And we need a package deal. And we have to be ready in that moment to propose the right package deal and to push for the right package deal. What happens if Germany exits the euro? Would this be the end of the euro? Would the other countries continue? I think at that point, I mean, what would France do? Would France prefer to be in a ramp euro or to exit? I mean, the euro would weaken substantially. Um, and uh, the key issue is that either way, a lot of the problems would be solved. Notice, it's very different if they exit than if you exit, right? If Spain or Italy exits, the problem is your currency goes down and you have debt, which is denominated in an expensive currency. So I owe 10 euros, which are 10 liter today, and when the liter exits, are worth 100 liter. Well, that's a problem, right? Whereas if they exit, it's the opposite. You owe the money in euros, and the euro depreciates, you can pay it back, okay? So it is very different, and it would solve some of the nominal problems. It would be a big mess politically. So, I, I mean, I'm not proposing that as an alternative. I just think it would be extremely complex. Thank you very much. Bene, e ringraziamo grazie, grazie per eh, grazie il per professor Garigano. Mi sembra che il messaggio. Thank you very much, Professor Garigano. So I understand that the euro will can stand, but that there's going to be an uphill task. And as Professor Garigano's website tells us, uh, there is nothing which is going to be given for free. Thank you. I'd like to remind the audience that. Uh, at 6.30 p.m., Daniel Gross is going to talk about the same subject and is going to talk about the stance of Germany. Indeed, reference is going to be made to the euro and to the monetary union as well.